Uh, da, da, da. Perfect. All right. All right. Sorry. Uh, do you need our video feed or is it just the audio? Just so I know how attentive we should be to like look at the uh, camera. And yeah. Like so um, how I would preferably like to do it is I would like to add the full video clips of like specific questions. Uh, I don't have, I, I decided I was going to finish the script. I have like an outline for how the video is going to go. And then mm -hmm. I'll finish the specifics of the scripts, like the actual words used and everything based on exactly what answers I get here. So I can use the answers to develop the flow of the video. Um, Got it. But uh, I would like preferably to have uh, the video clips in the uh, of the answers within like the segments of the video, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool. Yeah, sounds good. I just wanted to make sure if it was like if we're like not paying not not paying attention, but it's like if we're like looking around or whatever, it's like knowing that you want the video is helpful. So yeah, sweet, perfect. sounds good. All right. Well, let me figure out how to edit this. Remove this tile. Minimize. Oh, and I can move it out of the way, so it's, oh, no, I can't. It takes me out. Okay, that's fine. Perfect. Okay, um, and that said, um, <laughs> I was trying to think for forever of how to phrase this in a way that makes sense. Um, when a question's answered, uh, it would be great if you could answer it in a way that includes the question in the answer, so that way the answer in of itself makes sense on its own. So that way I don't yeah. have to include the questions. So like the first question is going to be um, something everybody knows about. Like before Odyssey, did you work in game development? If so, for which company? Um, I, I think everybody that plays uh, knows former Riot devs, but a lot. I'm hoping a lot of people that have never played Omega Strikers will be watching this and won't know about that. Um, so uh, therefore in the answer, if it would be like before uh, making Odyssey, uh, we did not work in game development, or before making Odyssey, we did work in game development, so that way, like, the whole picture's in the answer. Cool. cool. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So, uh, and with that said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, as I previously um, foreshadowed, first question. Before working in Odyssey, uh, did you guys work in game development, and if so, for which company? Yeah, before uh, we started Odyssey, we were working at Riot Games. Um, and both of us had been there for like six or seven that years. That was like a little over five years. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've been there a good amount of time. But what we met actually was working together on uh, TFT, uh, where we were the, the leads for that game and basically built it from a small team up to the point where we shipped it, <laughs> put it on multiple platforms. Just nothing plus. <laughs> yeah. All and, right. Uh, then like our other co-founder David, um, uh, who's like our design director here, he was at Riot for also like seven and a half years uh, before then. Yeah, starting Odyssey with us. All right, TFT is a great game, by the way. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, we can. Yeah, I guess. What else should we talk about? What else we worked at? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Like, yeah. No reason not to. Cool. All right, yeah. So we did TFT together uh, before that. I was on League of Legends gameplay, so it was like the, the team that was shipping like biweekly patches to League of Legends, balance updates, seasonal updates, content, and the like. Uh, that's where I met uh, David. Him and I worked together on that uh, before I got to then work with Dax on TFT. So it was a nice little like happy, happy band. And David did like lead champ design and like lead gameplay design stuff for like League for well, quite a few years. Um, so it was a fair, fair bit of stuff. But that's kind of like what. I started kind of speaking for him because he's not he's not here. Um, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, and then I was at I worked at Riot for seven or so years. Uh, I started off on the marketing side of things and did that for a few years there, um, and then went into like uh, research and development on new game prototypes. Uh, so I got to work on a couple of like really exciting, fun things there. But then uh, I played an ungodly amount of auto chess. Like I was playing <laughs> at like five a.m. every morning. Uh, at one point, I was like rank five on the global leaderboard just because I was playing so much. <laughs> uh, and so uh, when when we started TFT at Riot, I was like, that's a project I know I got to work on. Uh, have to have to be on that one. Uh, and so uh, that was kind of how I finished up my my time at Riot was uh, building TFT and then you know shipping. I was there until the third set, uh, I think. Mm. And that was around the time that we started Odyssey. That makes about. That makes sense, in my opinion, to start to go downhill in the third set. <laughs> uh, I still play it every day, though, so. 
CFT is um, a big game right now. Yeah. yeah. It's fun. My um, whole family <laughs> plays so much. <laughs> like my dad plays during his meetings at work. <laughs> That's what I do too. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can kind of like, he plays hyper role and mm -hmm. you can kind of like not really think about it, it, it's not as engaged, right? As playing the full game of TFT. Right. So he can like half focus on the meeting and like half focus on playing hyper role. Yeah. All right, on to our second question. Um, so usually when you see game developers leave a more stable job to create their own game and company, they would normally already have like a fairly clear idea about the game they want to make. Um, however, based on what was said in the Future of Omega Strikers video, it seems like you went through a lot of ideas before settling on Project B, which is now Omega Strikers. Uh, mm -hmm. That said, what sparked your transition from uh, the development job you had before into creating Odyssey, and how did that transition look? So what started the transition to go from Odyssey or from Riot to Odyssey? Um, initially, it was like very personally motivated. Um, I guess like, well, I guess this brand is like a few ways. Like when we were working on TFT, um, we saw like this crazy experience of like how quickly something could come together with like a really small team that was just like super motivated and excited about an idea. Um, and like, I remember like way back, like, I don't know, it was like a month and a half or two months into the prototype. We were just like, man, this would be so cool to do again someday. Um, uh, but we kind of forgot about it because then TFT went gangbusters and we, you know, we shipped and it was, our hairs were on fire all the time. But uh, I found out that we were, my wife and I were expecting our third child uh and our family was all up in canada uh la had been great but it was time for us to go home um and riot in my view is one of the absolute best places to make games uh in the games industry as a whole um and it was really difficult to like imagine being anywhere but riot so for me it was like well maybe the best chances to like take a lot of the best parts of you know riot's development priorities focus on the player game development focus making pvp competitive games and really trying to extract that into like a smaller form factor, uh, like a little small studio. Um, and then that's when Dax and I started talking about like, maybe, maybe we, maybe we try, maybe we do this thing. Uh, and David was, uh, like, uh, like it was, yeah, me, Dax, David, and then Eric, the, the four of us, um, uh, we started, yeah, well, we all left our jobs and then, and then started this and, uh, yeah, we didn't really know what we wanted to make. Uh, we just knew the types of games that we wanted to make and the type of impact that we wanted to have. Um, and a lot of that comes down to like, if you look at the games industry over the course of the last decade, like the number of games that have been successful, uh, that you would have predicted would become successful. Most of them were completely random, uh, and games that you think would, would pop off can fail for a variety of reasons. Like there's no real predicting what the next big game will be. Um, so for us, it was more about like a process by which we could find an idea that people thought was exciting that we believed we could turn into something and then kind of going that way versus having this like crystallized idea in our heads of like, oh, this is the perfect game because like building takes a long time. Yeah. The market changes really quickly. You might think like, you know, there's people that thought they had the best social deception game uh, in 2020 and they were gonna be shipping in 2021. And then Among Us popped off and then kind of gobbled the whole market. Um, and it's uh, like, it's difficult. You can't really predict success, success and over the course of like, yeah, many years, we wanted to be more flexible and be able to like, course correct and adjust and and kind of like understand what players are, are having fun with and, and building games that are more focused around them as opposed to what we think is cool sorry long answer but <laughs> no that was great thank you um that leads very well into the third question which is um, no. <laughs> omega strikers is very unique in how it plays um so how did you come up with the competitive air hockey idea and what made you stick with that one over other ideas yeah so the origins of Omega Strikers are a little odd. Uh, kind of like Richard just mentioned, when we when we started the studio, we didn't really know exactly what we were going uh, to end up making. So we had probably like 10 different prototype ideas uh, that we had written down on paper that we thought would be interesting to try. Mm -hmm. And the one that we ultimately ended up choosing was... <laughs> In, in, in our past, we worked on League of Legends, which was based on a mod in Dota uh, or in uh, Warcraft 3. We worked on uh, TFT, which was, you know, based on a mod in Dota. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we were like, oh, let's like look at mods for like inspiration. Pudge Wars. Yeah. <laughs> and there was like a Warcraft 3 mod called Pudge Wars. 
where uh, you would basically play as like the Pudge or the Abomination, and you like throw hooks out and try and grab other players, and you can use them to move across the map, but also like bring people to you and then, you know, knock them out. And so we started out with something that looked a lot like that, which if you saw the video, uh, like the, the video that we posted when we, we made the announcement um, about the future of Omega Strikers, there's like a little clip in it where these little dudes are like running around and like shooting the hooks at each other. Um, so that was kind of like the foundations of what we were building. But then the more and more that we played that, it was kind of like Super Smash Brothers almost meets like League of Legends with like a hook shot component to it. The more and more that we played it, the like more, it felt fun in the moment, but we were like, ah, this doesn't really feel like it has the depth or uniqueness to really stand out and be something that we're excited to make. Mm -hmm. So we started looking at all these different versions of it that we could build. Uh, and we had like a version where it was way more King of the Hill oriented. We had a version where we put a ball in it and you had to like push the ball to the other side of the map, um, probably about like half a dozen others as well. But it was that ball one that ended up being the most fun. Uh, and originally it was like a giant ball that you like had to hit with your abilities and move and it moved pretty slowly and it would knock people away if it hit them. Um, and then when we were playing that, we were like, it'd be a lot more fun if this was like a little faster, a little frenetic, like we kind of um, centered around this word raucous uh, as like a, you know, a tone or like an inspiration that we wanted to have for the game. And we just gradually made things like faster and faster and faster and faster until the game felt like it had that kind of uh, unique feel to it. And it was really when we got to that point that we were excited to try and like actually build this game. Mm -hmm. um, because for us, while we don't know exactly what we wanted to build or didn't at that time, we knew that we wanted to make something or make something that stands out from the, the, the crowd. And like, uh, we get that there are so many games that people could play on a daily basis that if yeah. we were to make something that was, you know, just a clone of something else or taking uh, two things and just mixing them together in a very obvious way, uh, that we probably wouldn't be something that was worthy of players' time because they could already get those feelings, that experience somewhere else. And so that was actually the part that like made us most committed to uh, building Omega Strikers in that early period is we felt like when we were playing it, we were like, damn, this is like, it doesn't feel like other games that we play. It like feels so unique. Like I'm getting something out of this that I don't get when I play League or when I play Rocket League or you know, Smash Brothers, any of the things that you could say are like, you know, close comparisons in some sense. Wind to Omega Strikers. Yeah, Wind Rammers at Lethal League, those were the closest yeah. things probably, honestly, right? Uh, and we thought that, and then we had players play it, and they said the same thing, where they were like, oh, this is not really like anything that I've played before. Like, it stands out, it's unique. Um, and so for us from there, we were like, all right, we found the idea, let's run with it. And then there were obviously many iterations and evolutions that the game had from that point. Uh, but that was kind of the the origins of how we ended up um, in that space, you know, going through a lot of different prototypes and then eventually finding something uh, that really felt like it had that that unique flavor to it. Yeah, I think we always said, like, if someone could describe our game as like, oh, it's just like League of Legends or just like Rocket League or just like Smash, it's like we probably didn't make a good enough thing. Yeah. We needed people to say, well, it's kind of like this. It's also a little bit of that. Um, so it wasn't just like a, yeah, a, a smaller version of a game people already knew. It's like the kind of the heuristic. Hmm. That makes a lot of sense. You, you definitely succeeded in that one because whenever I try to explain Omega Strikers to any of my friends that haven't played it before, it's always a challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was like, yeah, yeah. Think of like air hockey and also like League of Legends, but if it was if it was good, and then like. But there's also like other things involved with like level, like mm -hmm. it's <laughs> you just have to play it. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, totally, totally. And that like difficulty in description, we, we talked about it a little bit in the video, but it ended up being a bit of a double edged sword for us mm -hmm. that we're like currently trying to figure out when we think about our future things, how do we, how do we handle because like as a, you know, indie dev, being able to make something that you need or that's unique, like we just talked about is super important for being able to be successful because you can't just, you know, go make another battle royale or go, you know, do whatever the hot uh, uh, kind of like flavor of the month thing in development is um, because you're not going to stand out and the big studios are going to have marketing budgets. They're going to have the capability to just drown you out. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like, you know, just the way that things go, honestly. Uh, but you also have to make something that's not crazy wild enough that like people can explain it to their friends and they can explain it to their friends in a way where people are immediately like, oh, I get it. 
like that's an exciting thing uh, for me to get into. Um, I think that that was kind of one of the, the challenges that we ran into with Omega Strikers. A lot of the times, even when we did our play testing, we'd find that people would say things like, I didn't think that this game would be for me. And then I played it and it's insane. Like, I love it. Yeah. Like, this is my game. Uh, and the dopamine receptors be wild. And yeah, yeah. And, and I think that like, that's just a, you know, for, for any other indie devs in the world, um, an interesting thing to, to think about because you want to be unique, but you want to be unique in a way that people can easily share and explain the game to their friends. Um, or else you, you kind of get in a, a loop that I feel like we ended up in a little bit, which was that the game was too hard for our like really passionate players to explain to a broad enough group to bring them into the game. And, you know, we really appreciate everyone uh, who has done that, uh, but it just seems like it was a challenge at a level, uh, like a, a broad scale, you know? Yeah, I think important that you, Dax, Dax touched on like a little bit um, before there with like, you know, larger companies that can spend more on money, you know, like we see, and like players aren't necessarily wrong with this, but like they, they should have focused more on marketing and that would have saved Omega Strikers, but it's like, Realistically, we can only spend so much money on marketing um, before it stops making sense. And as an indie dev, you really do rely on like that organic growth, which comes from people who are able to convince their friends that this game is worth their time. Um, and like without that, it's like you can spend more money on marketing, but it's pushing a boulder up a hill. Uh, and uh, it's our job to make it as easy for you to be able to tell your friends that they should come and play a game. Uh, it's because yeah, there's only so much that we can do and spend on marketing to to get a game notice because you're competing in a really, really, really crowded industry. There's lots of games all the time. Yeah. Baldur's Gate, Tears of the Kingdom, Diablo 4, yeah. like Star, with Starfield and Star Citizen, I always get the two confused. It's like, there, it was a very crowded year this year and like trying to cut through the noise can be really difficult. And it's like, well, we're not gonna outspend Nintendo or Activision or other, like, yeah. there's only so much. Mm. Yeah. All right, so, um... On to the fourth one. Uh, what were some challenges you faced specifically early in development with Project B? Um, so there, like, I put that into a couple different categories. Like, the challenges that we faced with Project P early on were, some of them were, as developers, we had not built outside of the League of Legends engine. Mm -hmm. And so we were learning our way through a new engine, through a new ecosystem, and really trying to figure out like what we could do. Like we believed we could do anything, but it would just take time, right? And so we we're trying to figure out what are the things that are reasonable for us to do in the amount of time uh, based on the amount of funding that we had as a studio to do. Uh, and so that was like a, a big challenge at the gates. Um, I think another one kind of in that same vein was the hardest part of a project in my opinion is the prototype phase. Uh, when you're trying to come up with the idea, because there's so much uncertainty, you have to be able to like look forward into the future and basically say, based on what I'm playing right now and the vision of where this game can go in our heads, how do we get, like, do we actually believe we can get it there? What are the steps we have to take? Or is it like, you know, those two things can't actually link up. Um, you have to be able to see through that. You have to be able to articulate, you know, how the game is going to be different, how it's going to be something that players really want to uh, play over other things that they could be playing. Um, and so during that phase for us, uh, I'd say we honestly had like a lot of uh, self-doubt or like, you know, confidence kind of things where it's like, is this game good? Mm -hmm. Like, are, are we making something that's good? And that's where for us, the way to really get out of that was when we started playtesting with players in a bigger way. Um, like we probably had 20,000 plus people around, like come play Omega Strikers before we ever put it into a public beta. Yeah. Um, and when you actually are talking to players about the game, you can build up that confidence as a dev way more quickly than if you're just like sitting in a room and you know playing it with your team or playing it by yourself. Um, because you realize that you have rose tinted glasses, you have a, you know, a, a kind of a specific kind of bias towards the game. Uh, because it's obviously something that you're choosing to make, uh, but seeing players say the same kinds of things that you believe uh, about the game ultimately push us past that. It, it actually, it can come both ways too. It's like you can also, as a dev, like you will always see all the problems that a game has. So it's like uh, I remember even like when we first started playtesting, like we kept being like, "Oh no, people just liked it this week. Next week, though, 
yeah, they're next week. The people are going to tell us that it, it sucks. Yeah, yeah. And then it just kept not being true, but it's like without play testing, it's like, cause we believe that the game needed so much, but like you can spin forever on trying to make something better. But like at some point it's like, well, no, it is good enough. And like when you bring it out to people, they can tell you that it is. Uh, cause yeah, it's like our, as a dev, you're always going to see the issues. Yeah. Sorry. I cut you off. No, 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 just... totally. Totally. That's a, that's a good clarification. Like, I would say the other big category was just the amount of stuff. Like our experience, mostly in the past, was working at Riot and we worked on League of Legends, we worked on TFT, we worked on some stuff in R&D, but all of those were using like League of Legends characters, right? Mm -hmm. They were using this big IP that Riot had built up. Uh, and one of the things that we knew we wanted to do when we started was build characters that people felt like they could really connect with and could potentially become you know, a big IP uh, into the future that has a lot of impact to a lot of people. And we did that from scratch at the same time as like building the game from scratch and building all of our like servers and the back end infrastructure and whatnot from scratch. Uh, and that was just like a lot of stuff and obviously like putting it on all the consoles and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like there was a big challenge just as a small studio in like trying to actually even do the things that we thought were the baseline uh, like table stakes, you know, for the game, the things that had to be there. Um, and so I think that that was one of the, the big challenges was like, there was a lot more that we wanted to do for mm -hmm. the game. There were many more features, many more characters, things like that, that we wanted to put in before we went into beta and then before we went into the full launch. But as a small team, you know, with like limited uh, uh, runway, we always thought that that was kind of the most risky thing that we could do was just spending too much time on something that ultimately when we shipped it, players were like, oh, I didn't really care about that thing anyway. Mm -hmm. And then we miss the forest through the trees and don't end up seeing, you know, if the game is amazing or if the game has issues because uh, we spent too long cooking uh, ourselves internally. And so, uh, like, I think that that was a challenge. Another one, just like a mental hurdle to get over, to be like, you know, we think that this game is ready to put out mm -hmm. um, because if we were to, you know, take another six months, we don't think that we like reasonably really change the, uh, the chances of, of it being successful. Um, and that's always a really hard thing in dev because there's no objective lens that you can look at that through. You can't just say like, you know, oh, if we improve this part of the game, it's going to improve retention by this much. It's, you're taking bets on everything. And so uh, taking bets is hard because <laughs> you have to like put yourself out there at some point, you know? Yeah, right. especially for a multiplayer game because it's like, oh, if it's a single player narrative game, it's like, well, the, the scope is a lot clear it's like well the, yeah the whole story and experience needs to be done if it's not the game's not ready for a multiplayer game it's like well how many characters is enough how many more do you have to add after you ship and how quickly how much do you need on the feature side how many like there's so many different things that you can keep thinking you need more of but it's like well more of everything is better true like if we had 100 characters the game would have had greater retention it would have taken us a really long time to make 100 characters so it's like yeah. yeah, you have to you have to cut off at some point and then be like, all right, ship, learn. And then if things are working well, it's like then continue to invest and lean in, um, yeah. which is yeah, which is scary. It's and it's annoying because it's like, uh, you know, you ship and then like people will be pointing out all the things that you as a dev are all, and a player are like, yeah, we wanted that, too. Yeah. We want to get to that as well. We're get, it's coming to the next patch because uh, it's like we're we also we know we've been gamers our whole lives. So it's uh. Yeah. I mean, it, it can be frustrating, but it's also like satisfying to know, like, okay, our intuitions are still accurate. That like the things that we think are really important that need to get in really quickly are also what players identify as like, oh, the game really needs X, Y, and Z feature. Like, great, we're working on that. Um, yeah, it's uh, a, yeah. it's a, it's a perpetual struggle. It's the, the thing we talked about in the video where it's like it can always feel like you're like one iteration away from like solving like this core problem. You know, in our case, that you know that may have been like holding the game back, but it's like. At some point, you need to make a decision um, because, like, one iteration away, one iteration away, that can go into perpetuity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, the last thing I'd say on that that part is basically like probably notice that like all of the things that we're saying are kind of like stuff that's in our own heads. Mm -hmm. Where a lot of the challenges for Omega Strikers, mm -hmm. I think that, that was like honestly true because, like, we look at what we have built, we look at like the community, we look at like the characters, the gameplay. The stuff that we were able to do, even things like doing the trailer with like Studio Trigger or having, you know, like Moist and Rakeem have that like epic battle with each other uh, in the uh, creator versus during the beta. Yeah. And like so many of the things that we did, we felt like 
like we're just really proud of and they didn't actually feel that hard as we were doing them <laughs> like as weird as that sounds yeah. like most of those things kind of just came together and we were able to do them like better than i thought that we were going to be able to in most instances uh just a lot of the the challenges in development are you know your own your own kind of uh trepidations or your own kind of hang-ups on things uh and we got like so blessed with like the team that we were able to build here mm -hmm. and all of the amazing things that we were able to do that I feel like on the execution end, uh, it, like none of that oddly ended up really being a challenge except for and making a lot of stuff. Yeah. Like the stuff that we made, we felt was really good, but we just, we want more of it, you know? Mm -hmm. Banger after banger after banger. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, so. A lot of players and even a lot of people that don't play the game are very drawn to the characters themselves. Was there a specific design philosophy that was used for the creation of the characters? Yeah. Uh, when we were creating the characters in Omega Strikers, we had three kind of principles that we wanted to hold to uh, for the characters, uh, like three pillars, I would say. Uh, the first one is that we wanted the characters to feel uh, aspirational. So that's that you know quality that you get when you play like a champion in League of Legends and everything from the way that they play in game to the way that they look seems to sell you this like fantasy of, oh, like it would be so cool to be Juliet. Like I know what Juliet's all about and she's just like a larger than life version uh, of the second pillar, which was we wanted characters to feel uh, relatable. Um, we wanted characters to feel like they were, they could be, you know, they have personality attributes of uh, characters that exist in your actual life, you know, your friends, your family, yourself. Um, and we wanted players to be able to look at them and see like bits of uh, those characters in their own life uh, and the characters in the game. Uh, and you could tell that's why like we have a pretty wide range of like, you know, emotions and like archetypes and whatnot in the game. They're not all just like edgy, like badass characters or whatever, because uh, that's just not the truth of like, you know, how, how you go about your, your daily life. And we thought that while having the characters be aspirational is important, it's also really important for them to feel like someone that you could like actually call your friend or someone who you could call your family. Uh, and uh, the third quality was that <laughs> we we kind of we wanted to be something like Genshin meets Overwatch, mm -hmm. where we have that kind of like I mean uh, at the studio a lot of us are are big weeps, so uh, we like the anime aesthetic a lot. Uh, and we love what MiHoYo, uh, particularly with Genshin, and then, you know, in the future, ZZZ are going to do with that aesthetic. And so we wanted to take that, but we wanted to do it to, like, a much broader cast of characters than was possible in something like Genshin, you know? So we wanted to have an eight-foot-tall hamster who weighs two tons running alongside a normal human like Juliet, running alongside uh, your app turned into a uh, cat girl uh, <laughs> glitch mage, right? Uh, I mean, and... I think that those were those were really the three things we wanted. The character fantasies needed to feel super aspirational. The character uh, identities needed to feel really relatable. And then there needed to be a pretty broad kind of aesthetic set of the characters. And we hoped with that, that there would be someone, like a character for basically everybody, um, that there would be a character that you found affinity to, uh, either in how they played or how they looked or how they talked or uh, what their identity you know said about them. Uh, and to us, like, I think we felt like we were able to hit that pretty well. Mm -hmm. And it's why we're excited to try and take the characters from Omega Strikers and apply them to a bunch of different environments. Because uh, that was also, I guess, an unspoken fourth principle as we were developing them was we wanted, we always wanted to try and build an IP that we could use across many things in the future, whether that's making an anime, whether that's making more games, whatever. And so we thought of each character through the lens of like, can this character have their own season of an anime? And I was like, literally, as we were making every character, we would ask ourselves that question. Like, you know, does X feel like he could be the star of a season of an anime? Does Juliet feel like she could be the star of a season of an anime? Does Aini? All those kinds of things uh, uh, for every character we were we were looking at. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, we just we wanted to make them cool too. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, yeah, you see like a lot of like the passion that went into the characters, both like on the art side and like the design side. Uh, it's also like unspoken like engineering that also helps with it's like yeah like you know just seeing like the character designs like Madump and Striker with like the the models Sean and Drake on animation like the VFX the the design crew like everyone just like put everything that they could into making all the characters feel like 
just a unique yet yeah, cast of this universe that we were building. And I think that's you know one of the reasons. I mean, more like I guess like macro level or meta level was like. I mean, like the sunset announce sucked for us, but I think like a lot of like the reception from people I think was like more positive than like I think even we could have hoped for because people felt like we had put that kind of passion and love into like the overall game, the characters and everything that we built. Um, so yeah, the hope is that we can just yeah like lean forward or lean, look to the future and just like yeah lever- make some other cool stuff with the the things we've built. Yeah, I know. I definitely am personally looking forward to uh the future stuff that comes out of course i'll probably be playing omega strikers until i'm old and gray but uh, i'll be doing the <laughs> other stuff too <laughs> heck yeah um so uh in the future of omega strikers video uh it kind of seemed like that the rate ratio of um purchases to players was fairly good but that there just mm-hmm. wasn't a large enough player base for it to be sustainable mm-hmm. um do you know what kind of player base size would have been needed to sustain Omega Strikers and how far away we were from that? And this one doesn't have to go too in depth. Yeah, to sustain Omega Strikers with the uh, like monetization that we were having on a per player basis uh, during the, the full launch of the game, uh, our estimate was we would have needed somewhere around like 20,000 concurrent players, somewhere in the 10 to 20,000 range to have that be like basically as a studio omega strikers is able to sustain itself and then just put a little bit back into the studio so we can also think about new things for the future yeah um because that's always you know an important part of of running a game studio if you ever are like just in the position where you're only ever breaking even on something it gets really hard to make that thing cooler and it also gets really hard to just do interesting ideas like if we wanted to do an anime (laughs) or something for the characters you know to try and help promote omega strikers or future games or whatever um, that wouldn't really be possible. So we think that like the 10 to 20,000 range uh, was kind of that that sweet across spot. all platforms. Yeah, across all platforms uh, for us there. And uh, it's not like you know when the game launched, we were that far off of that, but we kind of uh, we expected some amount of decline from the launch, right? So I don't think that the position that the game ended up in is like all too. Uh, uh, surprising, uh, like for the amount of, of CCU uh, uh, that it was able to have. Um, but like the thing that, that we we hoped was we could have had a bigger, you know, kind peak. of peak at the beginning and then the tail down would have been to that like 10 to 20,000 range. Um, and if we hadn't hit that, then we would have wanted to see like, you know, we're able to slowly grow this thing to the 10 to 20,000 range uh, over time. Um, you know, just as a Kind of like insight into how a game dev might think about that part of the the business yeah and like instead of what we were seeing like when we would launch new updates whether that was summer splash and new characters like you would see like a bump in the player numbers and then like it would just return back to where it had been before within a matter of days or realistically what we hope to see is like a bump and then like decline but above where it used to be you release more content you get another bump and you decline above where it had been before so you get that slow growth over time or you get some amount of like organic growth that's coming out of like, oh, a big streamer in another country is playing. And then suddenly this whole region um, is like falling in love with this game and you have a bunch of growth, you know, coming from that. But without being able to like see that type of thing happening from yeah. the content updates, it's like, okay, it's it's probably not going to be this game unless there's something crazy that changes. But at that point, if we're changing like the foundations of the game, it's like we're the people that currently love it will probably no longer like it anymore. So it's yeah, it, like I've stuck between a rock and a hard place Mm, right um in that same video uh you talked a lot about uh the different lessons that were learned when developing omega strikers all the way to the present what were some of your biggest takeaways that you hope to apply to your future games Mm. youtube thumbnail yeah so i think in turn in terms of okay so there's probably uh, I'll go through them rather than say a number at the beginning. Uh, but for the big lessons uh, that we're taking away from Omega Strikers and trying to apply to uh, our future games, um, I think one big one is we need to try and do fewer things better as a studio. And I know that that sounds like a little contradictory to something that we just said around like, hey, we wanted to you know put more content and stuff into the game. Uh, but really what I mean by that is like, 
we need to be more selective about the big bets that we do take with the game rather than trying to do everything. Um, and so a big example for us here was like with Omega Strikers, we tried to make it work on every platform from day one. Mm -hmm. And we really tried to like make sure that the experience was like good on an old mobile phone. And we designed a lot of aspects of the game kind of around that constraint. Mm -hmm. uh, and that just ended up being something that was like quite difficult for us to maintain over the course of development. Like it's easier to make a game for one platform or two platforms than it is to make a game and say, we are going to make it from day one uh, really good across all platforms. And so that's to say that uh, if we had not done that, we probably could have focused on some of those other things more that we weren't able to actually uh, eventually put in the game. Uh, so like focus is, is a big one. Uh, I think another one is uh, think about the depth of gameplay in the game. And I believe Omega Strikers is a very deep game. You know, I like I, I've played it for 2000 and a half hours or something. Uh, and I know that there are many players who also have put that amount of time into it. And it's got this like crazy skill, but the that depth is not apparent to a lot of people. Uh, and what we saw was a lot of people kind of write it off as like a party game almost uh, in a lot of ways, uh, because that that depth just doesn't feel as punchy as if you know, you're watching a game of Valorant or you're watching um, like a game of League of Legends where uh, those kinds of like skill tests make themselves much more uh, immediately apparent uh, in ways that players can really like aspire to. Uh, and so making like the depth of the game feel aspirational uh, was a big one uh, to us. And a lot of that honestly relates to the stuff that we we're talking about uh, for focusing on multiple platforms, where it was hard to make an, a, ga a game that had those kinds of appreciable skill tests, but also have it work on a phone. Um, like, you know, things like having everything happen on uh, one screen, like needing to have it work on 100 or 150 millisecond ping uh, kind of stuff. And I, I know people will laugh at that because it ended up uh, not quite being playable at that amount, but that was a goal that we had, you know, at one point in development. Um, and then the third big one, uh, from my opinion, is uh, think about how the game organically markets itself. Uh, and so the way that we kind of contextualize this is like, think of what, as a content creator, the YouTube thumbnail that you would need to make for Omega Strikers uh, would be. Because we think about growth in like two senses. There's the player to player growth of like, you know, I go and I tell all my friends like Omega Strikers is awesome. Come play Omega Strikers with me. Uh, and we need to give that person good reasons to tell their friend that the game is something mm -hmm. that they should play instead of whatever other game they're playing right now. Uh, and then the other one is like a uh, big, you know, a content creator uh, like yourself, like talking to uh, a wider community about why this is a game that they should play. And obviously that's like a, you know, a kind of reciprocal relationship where the content creator is gonna to wanna to make stuff that the community is gonna find fun to watch. And then you get into that positive feedback cycle of making those kinds of things. And with Omega Strikers, because of the camera angle, because of how zoomed out everything is, because of a lot of the decisions we made to make it work uh, on mobile, honestly, uh, we ended up in a position where I think for someone creating content, it's relatively difficult uh, to think about what the exciting YouTube thumbnail for Omega Strikers would be uh, that would make it better to create for your channel uh, than uh, making another game. And so like that obviously doesn't mean that it's impossible. And like a lot of amazing people in our community have found out how to try and make Omega yeah. Strikers seem appealing in that kind of sense. Uh, but I think we, we, we didn't really do people that many favors there. We made it more challenging uh, than it necessarily should be. And so uh, for future games, for me, at least, uh, it's it's thinking through those three things. How do we try and focus, uh, like rein in the number of things that we really care about early on? How do we like emphasize the skill tests and depth of the game uh, to feel like it's something that people want to spend, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of hours really perfecting and mastering and make it so that if you're someone who's really good at the game and people look at you playing really well, they're like, damn, like that person's sick. Uh, and then lastly, you know, make it so that the game is is more easily shareable uh, between friends and more easily shareable for uh, content creators to uh, their communities um, in terms of like, you know, the excitement, uh, the kinds of like thrill uh, and immersion that can happen in the in the course of a game. Like make it easy and desirable to make content for, for a long period of time. I think that was another thing we heard is like, yeah, it was difficult to like come up with new things to like make content about. It's like, well, there's a patch drop, there's a new character, I did a core flip goal, but they, those all start to look kind of samey. It's like, you know, Baron steals and League of Legends at 
they used to be really cool and now they happen a lot so they're less cool yeah. so it's like yeah, how do you make like that highlight reel generator that just like continuously like gives players opportunities that are really exciting to share hmm. yeah i know personally because i did a lot of tutorial videos or like a informational helping people to get up to the competitive level and it was very frustrating that I'd make like a guide for a character and then next patch, none of that is relevant anymore. Um, yeah. Although I will say overall, my um, my method of making videos is improved overall because of it. It's like, all right, how can I make sure my content lasts a long time? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the, uh, the artificial hurdle there to help me improve. <laughs> yeah, it was training ground. We were uh, just trying to help you all get better. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. That should be done later. Okay. So uh, in Omega Strikers, there are various canon teams uh, that the characters belong to within the story. Uh, since future titles will not be based on Core Strike, do we know how these teams will uh, affect or influence the story of future titles with the characters? Uh, somewhat. So basically the teams in Omega Strikers, how will they show up in the future? Um, the way that we thought about the teams, they were actually a relatively late addition into the uh, canon, you could call it, of Omega Strikers, where we kind of knew that the characters were going to be playing on teams together, but we didn't create those like kind of like branded team aspects really until we did the piece with Studio Trigger, uh, because we, in our creative collaboration with them, found that to be something that like got both of us really excited, was creating more of the idea of these like teams. Um, they existed a little bit before then, but not not really in that in that same form. Uh, and so the thing that like that kind of means is that the teams are more about like bringing certain characters together and creating interesting relationships between those characters. And so the teams kind of serve as like a, a hub of that. You know, like there's a relationship between Kai, X, and Era because they've spent a bunch of time together on this thing uh, uh, in the past and. Uh, there's a relationship between Juliet, Dubu, and Estelle because they spent a bunch of time on this team together. Uh, and those relationships definitely persist into the future. Whether or not we make a game where those teams are like actually competing against each other, you know, in the canon as those exact same teams, uh, not exactly sure. But the thing that definitely will persist is the uh, idea that these characters have spent a bunch of time together. They have unique relationships. And so the characters who were on teams together in the past are probably uh, much closer to each other. And for whatever we do on the narrative end in the future, uh, we'll likely continue to serve as like the hubs of relationship in the game. You know, if you're building your big relationship chart of how all the characters uh, kind of fit together, uh, the teams would be kind of the, the centralizing uh, element of that. Um, and the other thing I would say is like, we don't quite know yet exactly what role core strike will play in the future of the omega strikers universe it might still be there mm -hmm. <laughs> it might just not be the thing that you're doing when you're actually playing the game uh if you know what i mean mm. there's just an island up in the sky you can see it hovering above the clouds yes. <laughs> yeah. um i <laughs> I'm hesitant to even ask this question because it's such a loaded question, <laughs> but it feels necessary to ask. Um, what can you tell us about the next project that you're working on? Their games. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, yeah, we probably want to stay pretty light on the details here generally, but actually here, you, you go. Do your thing. <laughs> I mean, I think we do. <laughs> yeah. Like for the next games, uh, Competitive but PvP. like Maple saying, we do we do want to stay pretty light. We do want to stay in the competitive PvP space, but our definition of what that means, I think, will expand a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, like I think one of the other challenges we didn't so much mention this that we ran into with Omega Strikers was, uh, it, Omega Strikers is awesome at doing this kind of narrow slice of competitive games where it's like it's almost like a fighting game in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. where it has this like really sweaty like direct head to head confrontation. You need to be on a hundred percent of the time. That's really the only way to play a uh, kind of component, which is awesome. Like, I mean, obviously at our studio, we love that and we would play that kind of game infinitely, but that's like a challenge because it doesn't really appeal to uh, a really broad enough uh, player base, just like fighting games, you know, kind of struggle in that way. And so we want to try and find a way to maintain that kind of feeling for the people who want it, but then to create a game that's a little broader in also, you know, having other avenues for competition that aren't potentially as serious mm -hmm. as that um and then the other thing i think i don't know if we mentioned this in the 
video or if it was in one of the chats that we had after, but like we're going to be focused primarily on PC and then console awesome. yeah. uh, for the next things that we do and not so much thinking about mobile from the beginning. If we make something that's awesome and successful, we'll like take it to mobile eventually, but uh, we want to like really make something that's amazing on uh, PC and console before thinking about how would it extend outward? Because again, that was just one of the challenges we ran into on Omega Strikers was we feel like we limited ourselves or handicapped ourselves a little bit at the beginning uh, by just trying to keep mobile so central yeah. uh, to the focus. Um, and then, I mean, we're honestly like exploring a handful of genres at mm -hmm. this point. Um, they're all pretty competitive genres uh, in terms of like, their games that you are competitive in, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily, you know, their genres that a million other games are in, uh, but like, uh, we don't exactly know yet <laughs> what, what we'll commit to, but we want to play test really early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if anyone's like interested in yeah. trying them as soon as they are actually playable, uh, we'll, we'll definitely, uh, uh, be like putting some stuff up to, to try and get people to uh, have an opportunity to do that. Yeah. I think like the only thing I'd add is like, we're going to continue to try to do what we did with Omega Strikers, where it's like, we want to make a game where it's like, oh, it's kind of like, but, as yeah, opposed yeah. to, oh, it, this is just XYZ genre. Like, I think a lot of people were, you know, even in the comments on the Sunset video or in the community or otherwise, were like, it's a shame because like Omega Strikers was such a unique game. Yeah. And it sucks that unique games, like, don't often succeed. And it's like, that's true. I mean, most games actually doesn't, regardless of uniqueness or not, generally don't succeed. That's just the games industry. But for us, it's like we started a small studio because like it, it's exciting to be able to take like more, I don't know, risky shots at making something that's different than what people have seen before. Um, otherwise, you know, it's easier to stay at like a, a larger studio. So it's like for us, like what you can expect from the future games is that like we're not going to ship something that's just like another game you've seen. It, it has to be like a game you've seen, but with a pretty pretty core innovation that makes it different. Yeah, to the level of like, you know, Omega Strikers might be like League of Legends, or some people might describe it as such, but obviously <laughs> yeah, like, there's some pretty big differences between Omega Strikers and League of Legends. Yeah. All right. All right, time to circle back to some questions I skipped just in case we ran out of time here. Uh, okay. Uh, so there's a lot of people uh, that definitely seemed like they wanted a lot more cosmetics in the game. I know I had hundreds of comments in various videos of mine. I was like, oh, why don't they release more skins? Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, creating cosmetics is not a free endeavor. Uh, what was the most limiting factor in how many cosmetics could be produced? Uh, there's a number of things here. It's like size of team and time as like the main two. Um, it's like you can only make content so quickly, especially if you want to maintain like a really high quality bar. It's like, like making like a, you know, a new skin for like Fall Guys, um, like a new bean costume yeah. is way different than making a new skin for a character in Omega Strikers or a character in Apex Legends or League of Legends. Like there's a lot more that goes into it. Um, and you can only move so fast um, when, you know, taking into mind like sustainability and people have been able to take time off and rest. So like, this is where we go back to like that thing we said earlier, where it's like, yeah, if we had taken an extra six months or a year, we could have had more stuff, but then we would have been, you know, held back on other things. So for us, it's, it really comes down to like team size and the amount of time. It's like we could have had a team five times the size that we have, and we could have had way more cosmetics, but like probably wouldn't have also been the answer because like people didn't, don't want to just play Omega Strikers for cosmetics. It's like, no, there's other things that they, they want and need. So yeah, that'd be the main. Mm. Yeah. And I'd add one thing, which was basically like, at the, we also wanted to make more skins. We had a lot more concepts and ideas, honestly, for skins that we wanted to make. But yeah, like, like Richard was saying, we didn't think that making skins would bring more people into the game. Mm -hmm. And the issue that we were having was the cost to make a new skin. We were likely not going to make the cost of that back mm -hmm. on selling the skin because we didn't have that many players you know, in the game to the point where enough people would play that character who the skin was released for and buy, you know, the skin for that character if they had other, like, there's a bunch of decisions that, you know, go into like, am I going to buy a skin in the game? And once you filter down to that level with the player base size that we had, it was likely that the skins were like not going to pay themselves off individually. And so that's why we put everything on our end into like 
let's try and get new characters out, let's try and get new arenas out, let's try and like change up the core gameplay uh, in an attempt, you know, to really like attract more people into the game and then retain the people who are in the game better so we could eventually get to that point where the player base was big enough where it made sense for us to invest in building uh, skins uh, that could, you know, make incremental revenue for the, the studio. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Uh, my uh, my final question here is kind of ad hoc. Uh, what are your current thoughts on the on the competitive scene of Omega Strikers? Uh, okay. So, my current thoughts on the competitive scene of Omega Strikers. Uh, there's a really personal one first that I'll say, which is, uh, I never. Well, I did think this, but it's a different thing to think it and then to actually realize is like how trash. I am at the game now. <laughs> I, I used to be good. I used to play in the Discord with like all these people all the time. Like when we were running our play tests internally, we would have call it like 5 a.m. gang or whatever. And it was everyone who every time we did yeah. a play test, we would stay on till 5 a.m. playing. And I would like be there every night, like running games back. And I feel like I was pretty good back at that time, but like everyone has eclipsed so far. Um, like watching the teams that have played, I think that's the other big thing, the teams that have played together for a while now and have like an, a sense of like synergy and kind of like purpose on the team. Mm -hmm. And I know that there've been like, you know, some roster shuffles on the, the better teams in the yeah. last few months, but like a lot of them have now had a lot of experience playing together and like the teamwork and coordination that goes in uh, to the game at a high level uh, is also like beyond uh, in, in a lot of ways, what, what I had expected. Um, and then like, I, I think that, even though we are not releasing like new characters, I would imagine that in something like Melee or StarCraft Brood War or like Counter-Strike, uh, like that kind of fashion, people are just gonna keep pushing that ceiling up mm -hmm. and up and up and up uh, for those that do remain and play it. Uh, so the other thing that I'm, I'm excited about with the, the competitive community is just seeing like how it continues to evolve and uh, what playing Omega Strikers competitively looks like you know, even six months in the future uh, now, from now, uh, in terms of like how people's skills have, have really improved. Because like, I remember the days where uh, like, it was a revelation uh, to, to the good players in the game to like clear the core through, like if I'm mm -hmm. against somebody and my goal is open, like, send it down past the open goal which i know now sounds like the most basic like yeah. if you're gold you know how to do that but like even a year ago that was like tech <laughs> like it was something that people weren't doing that often you know yeah. so uh i'm excited to see what what all those uh, evolutions will, will be in the in the near future even yeah i'm also just like you know, it was like humbling to see like the amount of effort that was put into the competitive scene, not just by players, but by like organizers, uh, you know, like Coscord, Piachi, Saya, Brickbat, and like Co, you got like Vaudible doing like the primetime Tuesdays and stuff. It was just like markers down over an SEA. It's like everyone was just trying things and like going like, honestly, organizers pretty banger events, like with minimal to no support or like effort from us, which was like, crazy and like the types of things that they were pulling off for like full-on competitive seasons there's like the collegiate cup going on right now it's just like it's really really you know been inspiring for us to like see that level of like passion for the competitive scene exist kind of like at all because like one of the the main things that we want to do as a studio is kind of like we, we talk about like igniting the competitive spirit of the next generation of gamers like when we were younger like most of the people at the studio were competitive in one game or another some of us in multiple games and it was like games played such a huge part in like our childhood growing up on the competitive side that for us it's like oh you know we view this as like oh maybe it's our chance to kind of like give back and bring some of those experiences to like that that younger generation and uh seeing that passion kind of come out for omega strikers just gave us like this you know it was it was you know, i think humbling maybe cliche but it was just it was awesome uh, it yeah. was really it was really freaking cool to see even as like there was a decline in playership that like there was an increase in viewership kind of like event over event and tournament over tournament that was being run. So it was uh, like, we wish that we could have done more to help that grow by growing the game. But that's really like how we help is like, mm -hmm. we can we can help throw better events, but like the events ultimately won't be the difference maker. They'll be, they'll feel really good for people that are already here. But the biggest way that we help like a competitive scene grow is by like pushing the game further. Um, 
I know I'm kind of, I'm tangential a little bit, but like on, on that one, I remember like one of the coolest days that we had in the whole Omega Strikers team was when uh, people like, you know, Blue Blazing. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dream Hack. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And like uh, Dylan were like, you mm -hmm. know, throwing together that event. Yeah. And like, we're watching people actually play at a LAN. Mm -hmm. Like that was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, like, I honestly don't know if we expected that or like even thought like comprehended like oh that could be a thing that happens in that uh kind of like early phase for the game mm -hmm. but like watching uh when it was like you know uh that like the finals i remember like they had the camera and you see like mon like sitting at the desk yeah. and then after they win he's like oh like yeah. you know like those kinds of things uh like richard was saying you know those are the feelings that like we really wanted people to have with the game and watching the competitive scene is where like those feelings that yeah. we wanted people to have come across the most clearly because we see it when we watch events like that or even when we watch events that are you know happening digitally mm -hmm. uh and you can see like the the reactions that the players have or the reactions that like the viewers have yeah. uh, to seeing something awesome happen in the game uh it's 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 really cool stuff like honestly we could probably talk about that for yeah. days because of like how i don't know it's just like who we were mm -hmm. when we were at that age yeah and <laughs> yeah, I was playing the like weekend go for lols, which is like this Sunday league, uh, like tournament competitive league that existed on a website and just playing like League of Legends tournaments, uh, every weekend. It was like my whole Sunday was just that. It was like started at like 9 a.m. and just went till as well as far as you made it into the bracket. And it would just be like the same thing every weekend. It's just like, yeah, competitive game. It was just like my, I don't know, my lifeblood growing up. Yeah. And now you might, uh, I don't know. I think it would be fun if we throw together some Odyssey teams and honestly like join some of these events. And get slaughtered. So, so, some, some of the players have been asking us to do it. I'm ready. I'm ready to go in show match and uh, get absolutely destroyed. Yeah. Brick Bat and I are making an Arizona land. If you want to come out, uh, I think it's going to be probably early spring next year. <laughs> oh, nice. That's awesome. That would be sick. That would be sick. Yeah. Yeah. Send us the details when you when that's all set up so like we can try and plan early. Awesome. I think we just got the pricing hashed out with the venue. It's going to be at one of the conventions, I believe. Uh, nice. We have surprisingly good convention centers in Arizona. But, um, <laughs> yeah. And on a more like personal note, I've done a lot of competitive gaming in my life, like you guys have said. I even did it as a career for a while off mm -hmm. of uh, Dota 2, TF2, and Overwatch. Um, nice. And as far as like time like for the timeline that Omega Strikers has existed, the amount of time I put into Omega Strikers has already like beaten all of those games I played as a career. I have like yeah, yeah, yeah. 2,500 hours in like a seven month period. So I think that's like an that's average, crazy. an average of I think like six or seven hours a day of playing. Um, and it is by far some of the most fun competitive experiences I've had throughout my entire gaming history. So I'd like to thank you guys so much for creating this game. Dude, uh, I mean, thank you for playing it. Like, honestly, as developers, yeah, you could probably see just like how much we're smiling as we talk yeah. about this part. Like, that's that that's the part that like we're in it for. That's the excitement. It's not like you know, trying to make a bunch of money or something like that. Like, yeah, enough to enough to keep the lights on. But like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we just want to try and like create more stuff like that. Like those stories, you know. That's that's where like the fun of games really is. And like. It's just the most fun industry to work in. Mm. You know, I'm sure like on the on the competitive side too, it's more exciting than other things because like most of the people who are in it have that same kind of like passion. They they, they like want those same kinds of things. And like I worked in sports before I worked in video games. And like even though sports is kind of like that, it definitely didn't, it was not the same level. Mm. Uh it's just it's it's different. And it's like a you know, blessed industry, I guess. Speaking of which, we have to go to playtest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys so much for your time. Uh, I will let you know more about that Arizona land, and I'll let you know when this video is uh, looks decent. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. Yeah, thank you, Justice. Yeah, thank, thank you. Have a good day. Bye -bye.